Bernardo. Good morning and welcome to the Vermont House Human Services Committee. Today is Wednesday, March 30th. And the first part of this morning, we are um, going to be sort of discussing or get being um, educated on uh, the rule three of the three and four, whatever, of the Medical Cannabis Board. Um, and uh, this is rulemaking. This is not joint rules. This is not House rules. This is not Senate rules. This is LCAR rules, <laughs> Legislative Committee on um, Administrative Rules. Um, and uh, you know how we pass all these laws? And in the laws, they go, and the agency shall write rules. They go through a whole process where they write rules. And the end of that process is to present it to LCAR. LCAR um, and um, LCAR can approve or, or sort of not object. Yeah, approve or object. And part of their process of the process is, is that they send before they meet, they send the rules, the proposed rules to the committee chair of the committee of jurisdiction. Um, well, after many, many years, I've learned that I don't have to do this alone. So this year I've started sending the rules to the various members of the committee who um, have, that's been their area of, of jurisdiction and are, and the legislative council person um, actually is the one who does that. But in theory, I'm supposed to, I get a little sheet of paper and check meets legislative intent or doesn't, I forget what the third question is. Do you want me to answer? Yes, please. Okay, sure. So for the record, Michelle Child's Office of Legislative Council. And so there are very specific bases for Elkhart to be able to object to the rule. And they are in statute. And the ones that are your to focus on and then advise Elkhart on are um, uh, whether or not the proposed rule is beyond the authority of the agency that you granted them in the enabling legislation whether the proposed rule is contrary to the intent of the legislature, um, whether the proposed rule is arbitrary, or whether the proposed rule did not adhere to the strategy for maximizing public input prescribed by the administrative rules. So it's a very, very narrow kind of um, basis for an objection. And there's a lot of discretion on behalf of the agency to be adopting the rules. And, and even if LCAR objects to it, um, the agency can still um, can still have the rule go into effect. I mean, rules in a sense are similar to laws. Laws trump rules. So if we if we as a body don't like a rule and it doesn't and we can't object because it, our objection doesn't fit one of those criteria or whatever. I mean, it doesn't matter. Um, the agency can, um, and you know, um, implement the rule. So, but subsequent legislative sessions or in the legislature, they could then pass a rule, pass a law, to um, clarify or to change something. Um, so that's I wanted. I mean, so it's not like if we like or don't don't like a rule, um, that's not our job. Um, it is the you know, it it is only in those criteria. Um, but I, this was, um, so that's sort of why, you know, the, the context by which um, I wanted folks, I wanted us to hear this. And this is um, at one point in time, medical marijuana was the jurisdiction of this committee um, and uh, cannabis, excuse me, medical cannabis was the jurisdiction of this committee. And that predated legalization. And with legalization, um, there needed, to be some changes. And within the law that we passed, the exit, we, I believe, um, we transferred, we gave a lot of authority to the Cannabis Control Board um, to, by rule, um, uh, implement new things. So that's sort of where we are. And I thought we could spend um, about an hour max. Um, sort of being an introduction, um, what they are, um, um, and so that we can understand this. And I don't know, um, 
Michelle, whether you want to start or whether David, you want to um, start. We didn't chat. We can, uh, we, we chat a little bit. I thought it'd be okay. good if um, I started and kind of laid the foundation just to remind folks about um, what this body has done over the last several years with regard to it. And then David can really get into the details of focus. So good morning for the record, Michelle Child, Office of Legislative Council. And, um, and so the chair explained a little bit about the history of it, um, uh, just because I know we have some new members and folks who might not have worked on this issue just in on this committee. Um, so Vermont enacted uh, medical cannabis law in 2004. I think we were the ninth state to do it. It had been percolating for a few years. There were study committees recommending it. And so we adopted that in 2004. Um, so we've had it for quite a while. It was housed in the Department of Public Safety. So Vermont was the only uh, state that had a medical cannabis program that was kind of run by the law, by law enforcement. Um, and it was in uh, Department of Public Safety until this year when it transferred over to the Cannabis Control Board. Um, Vermont did legalize possession of smaller amounts of cannabis for everyone, and I believe 2018 or so was, I think, decrim in 2013, 2014, and then legalization in 2018, and then you passed a uh, kind of like an omnibus cannabis bill uh, setting up the commercial market in 20. 20, I don't know, everything, everything with COVID is like blending together the timelines, but so I think that was in 2020 and that was like the really big bill that kind of set everything up. And the idea was to um, create the new entity, the Cannabis Control Board, that was going to regulate everything with regard to um, uh, sale and dispensing of cannabis in a legal manner. And so setting up the, co the commercial piece, but then also shifting over the medical program um, to the Cannabis Control Board. And so with the medical program, you have a registry and folks go through and they um, work with their uh, healthcare provider. The healthcare provider um, can fill out a medical verification form saying that the person uh, has a qualifying medical condition that's provided that condition, a medical condition is provided by statute and who qualifies. Um, and uh, so it's not a prescription for cannabis. It is simply the healthcare provider who you have a relationship <laughs> with stating that you that you have one of the conditions that's listed um, by statute. And then um, that would qualify you for the registry. Um, and then once you are on the registry, you're allowed to have a little bit more cannabis uh, on hand than someone who's not on the registry. So you can have a, a couple more immature plants um, than if you weren't on the registry, you can also um, have uh, up to two ounces in possession separate and apart from what you cultivate off of your plants that you keep with your plants. So there's some little advantages there in terms of amounts. Um, but the big one is that you could go to a dispensary. So Vermont, I think, adopted the dispensary law in 2011. And so we've had dispensaries. There's five licenses. They're limit, it's a limited number of licenses. And they're allowed to have up to two locations where they serve patients. Um, and uh, so that was the, the way that if you weren't going to uh, grow your own cannabis, um, that you could go to a dispensary and obtain uh, flour and cannabis products and do that legally. And so there's, the legislature decided to continue the medical program. Um, and you have, if you, and I uh, sent Julie the links to the statutes for you. So if you wanna just take a look at those at some point, but I wanted to just kind of go through and just talk a little bit about what are the differences, like what does being on the registry get you that, you know, just any one of us just not being a, a citizen wouldn't be able to do. And so according to statute, um, so, uh, and these are some of the differences between a dispensary and what will be a commercial retail store. Um, dispensary is allowed to be vertically integrated under one license. So they do everything from, cultivation to sale to patients. Um, that is different from the commercial system and that you have to get an individual license for cultivation or for product manufacturing or for retail. Um, with the exception of the existing dispensaries are allowed to apply for, for something called an integrated license. 
under the commercial, and it's just those existing five licensees under the dispensary law now that can get them integrated, and that would allow them to be continue to be integrated under the commercial system. So they are a little bit different from everybody else, but they can be, uh, but dispensaries can continue to be vertically integrated. Um, the cannabis and cannabis products that they sell are not taxed. Um, so different from the commercial, um, they can deliver to patients and caregivers that's not permitted under the commercial system. Um, they can um, allow patients and caregivers to purchase uh, cannabis and cannabis products um, kind of like with a drive through or things like that, because a lot of patients have mobility issues. So they're allowed to kind of bring it out. To, in addition to delivery, they can bring it out to someone's car, things like that. Um, they can produce and sell cannabis and cannabis products that have a higher THC content than what is allowed under the commercial uh, program. Um, and they can um, produce and sell certain products that might not otherwise be permitted under the, under the commercial system. And then they can sell um, larger amounts. So they can do like per transaction up to two ounces instead of one ounce, which is in the regular domain. So those are just kind of some of the basic differences um, if you're gonna be under the, in the registry instead of just going and purchasing as, as any, any person. Um, so when you passed the uh, legislation in 2020, um, you directed the CCB to be doing a lot of rulemaking. It's like pages and pages of the long list and, it's, and you have the link there if you wanna take a look at it. But a couple of things I wanted to note is that, um, let me look at the language here, is, is some of the lead-in language. I have it. Let's see. So if we're looking at, and I'll just give you the citation in case somebody wants to take a look at it later, it's 7 VSA section 974 for rulemaking for dispensaries. Um, is it says that the board shall adopt rules to implement and administer the chapter. In adoption of the rules, the board shall strive for consistency with rules adopted for cannabis establishments uh, where appropriate. So the goal is that you don't have completely different systems for regulating a, a medical dispensary versus a licensee under the commercial system, because a lot of the things are make sense to be the same and that they are to be focused on where there's there needs to be a difference because of what is there in statute or because of policy of the CCB that there will be a distinction, but for the most part, they're gonna be regulated very similarly. And then there's also something in the law that says that no rule shall be more restrictive than any rule adopted by the Department of Public Safety under the old system. So the idea being that, so under the, the previous medical system, there were, uh, there were quite a few uh, restrictions and then the, the rules reflected that. And then in light of there being an open mark, commercial market, then it, the legislature decided it didn't really make sense to have a more restrictive medical market than you would have for a commercial market. So because why would anybody go through and jump through the hoops to access this way if you could just walk into any store? Um, and so those are two things that you just want to keep in mind is that you directed the CCB to be having the same rules as much as possible between the medical and the commercial market, and also that they were not to have more restrictive rules than were under the, the Department of Public Safety. Um, I just uh, ask a question. So what is the um, rationale for, for that conclusion or that uh, situation that they will not have that want the rules to be almost the same, right? Right, so like uh, something might be, let's say, you know, I know that uh, one thing that has been, I think everybody would universally agree that's been somewhat lacking in the, the medical program is that there, there wasn't really much around te testing requirements um, in, the, in the previous statutes that regulated the medical market um, or obviously in the rules. Um, but then the CCB is developing rules, uh, extensive rules at your directive through the last legislation about coming up with, you know, how often you have to test, who has to test, when you have to test, what you have to test for, all of those types of things. And if you're thinking about it from a consumer safety standpoint, 
Is there any reason why you should have different testing standards, you know, if you're taking a product to the public, whether it's a medical patient or not, is there any reason why you should have different testing standards for the for a dispensary versus an, an integrated licensee? Probably not. Um, and so I think that what they wanted to do is try to keep some, some things consistent. And, and Michelle, if I recall, that was in the law that the body passed. Correct. So on some level, also, if you have further questions about what was in the law we passed and what that was passed, it is to ask um, a, a representative Gannon who reported it on the floor. Um, I did see a question from um, Thank you. Jessica. Yeah, and I'm not sure. So you can just tell me if this is more of the law, the new law. Sure. I just worry about the testing only because some people who need medical marijuana need medical marijuana and a certain level of THC specific to them because that's what's going to help them deal with whatever disease they're dealing with. And so it would it would seem like in the medical side, you need more um, testing to be sure that they're actually delivering a product that actually helps the patient versus if it's just me who wants to get high. Do you know what I'm saying? I know what you're saying. And I think David can probably address yeah. some of that. But I would say, you know, some things that are very standard in here that will require under both systems are things around. So if you're talking about potency, mm -hmm. potency is required. And that was actually that was the one thing that was required required under the previous statutes in the medical program was a clear labeling of, of THC content. What was lacking was more kind of the, you know, um, more extensive testing around contaminants and, you know, things like that. Um, and so, uh, so I think, that, you know, David can probably go in with in, into a little more in depth about what's required with regard to the labeling and the testing that's required. That's the law and not the rule. Okay. And we are not debating, debating the law that. Okay. right now. Yeah. Okay, sorry. That's okay. Um, I think that's, I mean, unless you have any other questions just about kind of the found foundation of, you know, why we're doing this. And right. David can probably talk a little bit about the timing of why they're coming in as emergency rules. And there's just been a lot of, you know, the, trying to get this program off the ground and, and do it in a, in, a, in a way that's kind of in keeping with the legislation, but they've had a, they've had a heavy lift over the last year or so trying to get everything done. And, um, Thank you. They have, and um, David, if you or whatever, I mean, in law, the, the rules for medical marijuana went away March 1st, and we passed the law. Um, and uh, well, and, and anyway, so that didn't, anyway, it didn't happen. So we needed, they needed to pass emergency rules so that this wasn't going to be a program that was operating. The idea was it could be put in the budget adjustment, but budget adjustment didn't quite move as quickly as possible as they, we thought people thought. Um, is it David or is it you who will um, talk about um, what were the existing prior to legalization? What were the existing um, requirements related to medical marijuana and how those are the same or different? I mean, I'm thinking of you had to choose whether or not you grew or whether you per or whether you used a dispensary. And there were um, points in terms of um, you could number of care whether or not you could have a care I'm not, caregiver is that what it was called right. a, a surrogate a, a surrogate called, to yeah. pick pick yeah. it up and how many ounces you could have and so I think that is what is of interest to this committee is those differences sure and and I'll I'll leave that to David but I will just note that. Those differences uh, came about through the adopted legislation in 2020, not through what, what they're doing through rulemaking. So things that have changed, like um, in terms of the old statutes, you uh, required a person to select just one dispensary to obtain their product from. Um, that was eliminated in the 2020 legislation because if you can go to any retail store then they thought well then then why should you have to pick one dispensary or, or things like that so there's a number of things like that but those were all things that were done on the statute and um and i think david has a list and he can talk to you about some of those 
Are there um, any qu uh, questions for Michelle? She's staying. So if, if, if David doesn't do it, answer all of our questions, we can <laughs> love Got it. back to you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thanks to the committee for having me this morning. For the record, uh, I'm David Chair, General Counsel to the Cannabis Control Board. Um, a few of you may have seen me in my prior role as uh, an Assistant Attorney General in the Attorney General's Office, but have moved to the board. And um, as folks mentioned, we've been working so very fast. And, but we should wait. take off on the thing. It says Assistant Attorney General. That is out of date. Okay, mm -hmm. so you are General Counsel, General, General Counsel, Counsel, Cannabis Control Board. That's right. This is worse than keeping up our address books when people <laughs> change. Um, so I thought I'd very quickly give a little background on the, <laughs> the larger structure the board has built and how we, uh, regulatory structure the board is building and, and a little bit on the process, but I don't wanna belabor any of that and then jive right into medical cannabis more specifically. But I think some of that background help, will help all of this make more sense. So the board, as it designed this system under the statutes that uh, enabled the board and the adult use system, uh, decided to enact five rules. The first rule is the licensing rule. The second rule is the general regulation of cannabis establishments. That's sort of like the, the heart of it, I'd say, in terms of the regulatory environment. Um, the third rule is the medical cannabis rule. The fourth rule is the compliance and enforcement rule. And the fifth rule is the board removal rule, which is sort of a separate little thing that's required. It doesn't have that much to do with regulation, but the statute does... Um, require the board to set up some rules about board members removing each other in the event of um, a for cause issue that might arise. Um, the, in terms of the work to get these rules done, as folks mentioned, um, it's very tight timelines, but the board was very uh, careful to get the maximum public input they could before we even filed the first rules, you know, we were, the board in general was very um, solicitous of public input at 25 board meetings at which there was public comment sessions at each one, uh, more than 100 comments in through our, through the public comment portal on the board's website. The board has a statutory advisory committee um, that met four times in full and had more than 70 different subcommittee meetings uh, last fall, worked with, um, or had a couple worked with a number of other entities. Had a couple of social, uh, sorry, yeah, social equity town halls. Um, had worked on those issues very carefully as well. Worked with across government with the tax department, agriculture, food and markets, uh, agency of natural resources, uh, health department, quite significantly. Um, so the process, even before we filed the first rules, was very much a collaborative process. Worked a lot with members of the public, with people with lived experience, people who are patients and caregivers had a lot of input on this. Um, and of course the board couldn't accept every preferred outcome that it heard naturally. Uh, and, and to some degree, some of the um, concerns that a regulatory body has to have uh, were in tension with some of the desires of commercial actors as you might expect. But I think generally the board was very uh, careful to work with that input. Once the rules were filed, uh, rule, one, uh, rule one and two in combination had 260 different, substantively different comments submitted during the public no notice and comment session. It took the board 16 hours of public meetings to work through all of those comments. And did they did accept, I'd say around 50% of them uh, and said no to about 50% of them. So they're very thoughtful in the process, did accept input. Uh, but, you know, again, as regulators had to um, say no to some of the suggestions. Um, diving now into rule three specifically. So uh, rule three, and I'll get to the chair's question about some of the differences in a moment here. Uh, rule three 
incorporates rules one and two quite significantly. And that meets one of those statutorily required objectives, which is to have the have maximum consistency between the medical regulatory system and the regular adult use system. There were two other um, goals the board was trying to meet as a constructed rule three, one of them statutory, one of them sort of the board's own of the board's own volition. The other statutory issue was to make the um, our rule not more restrictive than the Department of Public Safety rules. Um, and that frankly sometimes ran in tension with the um, requirement that the board be as consistent as possible with the adult use rules. So there had to be some carve outs there to accommodate that. And then the final goal that was really the board's own volition was to do the best they could to have the least change possible for patients and caregivers in order to make sure that patients and caregivers are able to access uh, medication, cannabis medication with, with the least interruption possible. So those are the three areas where the board was really trying to, or three goals, I should say, the board was really trying to meet. As I mentioned, the rule three heavily incorporates rules one and two. There are carve outs in rule three, especially with respect to the dispensaries. Uh, and those carve outs are, are accomplished one of two things. Either they are carve outs to accommodate statutory differences, where uh, Michelle went over the areas where dispensaries and patients and caregivers have access and can do certain things that adult use consumers cannot. And, or there was another set of carve outs that had to do with the Department of Public Safety rules where a review of our rules, rules one and two, showed that they were in fact more restrictive than the rules that had been imposed on the, uh, or imposed by the Department of Public Safety rules. So there's a few carve outs that have to do with that as well. With respect to patients and caregivers, rule three really did try to have a simple, clear system that is very similar to what patients and caregivers currently have to do. There are a few differences, but those are driven by statutory changes. And so I'll run through some of those statutory changes now and then open it up for questions and um, happy to have a longer conversation about anything that folks are interested in. Um, one of the changes that, again, this is statutorily driven, um, is caregiver fingerprinting, background check requirements. It did not used to be the case that caregivers needed to have a fingerprint supported background check. It used to, under the old statute, it, they simply, they did need a background check, but it was a name and date of birth background check, which is quicker and has a little bit less bureaucracy around it. The new statute does require the fingerprint supported background check. So that is a difference that the rule obviously has to embody. Uh, another difference is that there are no more designated dispensaries, as Michelle noted uh, a minute ago. No more appointments are required for patients or caregivers to pick up um, product. Um, yes. I, um, the, the, the dispensary question. Um, I understood, my memory could be faulty, that under um, the, old, the old thing, um, not only did patients, patients first had to decide whether they were going to grow their own or use a dispensary. They couldn't do both. And then if they decided that they wanted to access medical cannabis through a dispensary, they had to choose one. Okay. I, I believe that was the rule for a while. Of course, everything changed when a general there was the general allowance for Vermonters to grow a certain amount themselves. So there's, Michelle, jump in. Uh, so uh, that, you're correct. And it was that way for a number of years at the beginning. And then the legislature repealed that requirement several okay. years ago. Find like a sip. <laughs> well, there's been a lot of changes over, you know, the last you know, 16, 17 years with the program. So that was, that did change. And then, so that was not, so, um, so you are permitted now to, to grow or to use a dispensary. Okay. Don't remember that ever coming here, but that's all right. Um, just uh, in regard to the um, point that you were just making about caregivers and background checks. Um, so is that something that was in statute that caregivers were required to have background checks? 
in under both statutes, caregivers are required to have background checks. The difference is whether it's a so-called fingerprint supported background check right. that requires a little bit more. Um, I mean, they've got to get the FBI involved and, and have permissions to access some of these national databases. Right. right. And so that that was required in the uh, retail cannabis. It, that is required for workers at cannabis establishments and owners and principals of cannabis establishments for adult use. It is now required for caregivers as well. That was not previously the case. Caregivers used to have to have background checks, but not the fingerprint supported background check. Right. I guess I, maybe I need to be more specific in my question. It, does the statute say that caregivers are required to have fingerprint supported background checks? Yes, it does. Okay. Thank you. And so that was a statutorily driven change. And is that still the case? That became the case on March 1st when the new statutes came into play. That had not previously been the case. Um, what, what, let me, oh, sorry. Uh, sure. so, quick, so a caregiver, how many, so they're, they're growing for someone who's um, uh, receiving medical marijuana. They could be growing. They could also. They are also permitted to get uh, cannabis product from a dispensary on behalf of a patient. Okay. But if they're growing, how many plants do they grow? I believe it's two and seven. Two and seven. So sorry, two mature and seven immature. No, no, no. Many more do medical cannabis. I believe that's the no. that's the limit for for caregivers. For the same so under the medical program that hasn't changed so it's it's too mature and seven immature and under the uh just adult use anyone mm -hmm. is is too mature and four immature so you okay. can have an a few extra immature plants if you are on the registry thank you no problem um anything else i will keep going down the list here um the old statute did require a three month relationship uh, between a healthcare professional who submits the healthcare professional verification form in order for a patient to get on the registry. That uh, three month relationship is no longer in statute. Um, and the there is there used to be an appeal board that was it had sort of two functions. One was a general policy recommendation body, and also it served as an appeal for a page for somebody who wanted to be qualified as a patient, but whose um, medical healthcare professional would not deem them um, to have the symptoms that one would require in order to, or the I should it's not the symptoms, the um, the condition that one would require to get such a card, and so then the board could step in. The person could appeal to that board, and they could step in. That board is not in the current statutes either. That is no longer present. Just when you say things are no longer in statute, that is because of the law we passed focusing. Is that correct? My That's correct. Is, the law we passed around legalizing recreational cannabis specifically um, had all the laws related to medical cannabis disappearing. That's exactly um, right. Okay. And it replaced them with a new set of laws and the changes that I'm listing are primarily, are all statutorily driven changes. There's one coming up that is not, which I'll get to in a moment. <laughs> um, another statutory change, this is more detail oriented, uh, is with respect to principles of dispensaries used to need to get their background checks renewed every three years. That's now gonna be every year. Um, and that was uh, in a statutory change. The final change that is that is different um, and is much more, which is really a board change, is the criminal history records issue. So the board created a set of rules around what criminal history records might be disqualifying for uh, individuals who are trying to get involved in the adult use market. And the, without getting too much into too great detail, essentially what they did was say that for many offenses, that will not be a disqualifying factor. There's a list of some offenses where it could be a presumptively disqualifying factor, but there is no offense that is absolutely disqualifying. A person who has a presumptively disqualifying offense will have an opportunity to essentially make a case as to why they should still be allowed to get a license. 
that is different than the prior Department of Public Safety rules, which did which in which the disqualifying offenses were absolutely disqualifying. Um, and the board chose to simply adopt its adult use regulations with respect to criminal history and import them into rule three cannabis regulations as well. So that's a little bit of a difference um, that is, but it is it's something that's consistent across the board at the regulatory scheme, both for adult use and for medical. Those are the changes that I have. I also can address the question about the emergency adoption if you'd like now. Sure. Um, so oh, let, me, before, oh, sorry. let me just make sure. I was going to say something you had mentioned was that there are no longer any medical dispensaries or, you know, what do you, what do you call it, apart from retail establishments. Is that what you said or maybe I misunderstood? Um, I didn't, I didn't mean to. If I did, there are still um, separate medical dispensaries. They will have the opportunity if they would like to apply to get a certain type of license that could allow them to be both a dispensary and an adult use retail store. Oh, I, I thought they had to eliminate Don't they have to have two? Um, and Topper, um, Topper, go ahead, then I have a question. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Madam Chair. Um, I, I'd like to talk about uh, the ability to go from one dispensary to another. Um, could an individual uh, in one day, visit all five dispensaries? Um, I mean, I guess it's theoretically possible that with a very fast car uh, and good weather, you could make it. Um, well, let's just talk about the principle. Uh, could an individual go to uh, uh, several of the dispensaries in one day and be served by each one of them. You could go to uh, different dispensaries each day and, you, and under the new statute, you could be served at multiple dispensaries. The statute did change with respect to that. Well, I, I, I didn't realize that the stat, that, that it changed that much. I, I thought that uh, you couldn't go, you couldn't go and get served in, in several dispensaries in one day or in one week, um, there, there were limits. Now it appears there are no limits in the uh, medical end of this thing. Am I, am I wrong on that now? So there is, a, there is a two ounce per transaction limit that is in statute. Uh, it is true that there's no longer designated dispensary, so a person could choose which one they, they go to. But they could choose, I, I'm, tr I'm trying to, they could choose to go to several in one day and, and get their two ounces. That's right. Well, that's not, that's not, I did not think that that was the intent of the legislature, but I could be wrong. I, I thought that, okay, thank you. You're welcome. Um, I'm the, oh, sorry. This may be what you have been saying. Um, I, my memory, which we all decided is not so good on this. Um, I, um, I thought that, that uh, there would need to be two separate entrances. Oh, for the, yes. So, so, so if I am a dispensary, if I'm a, a recreational dispensary and I want to, be able to provide both products that there needs to be two entrances. So they need to be separate entrances is what I thought. There's no, no such requirement in statute. Okay. It is true, however, that if somebody were to dispense an, a, a um, product that's only permitted for a patient to an adult use consumer, they would be in violation of our rules and would be subject to sanction under our rules. So it is the obligation of those entities, which we call integrated licensees in the statute, to be sure that they're not mixing those two tasks. They also are required to provide um, for patient privacy to whatever extent that is important to the people who are coming in. Michelle. So I just, um, if it's okay, I just want to follow up on Topper's. Absolutely. With regard to that. So 
It used to be under the medical program that they were limited to purchasing two ounces per month yes. under the old system. But with the new adult use, it's um, an ounce per transaction. And so the medical was true up with that same policy to be two ounces per transaction. So you wouldn't have it be more restrictive for a medical patient than if they were going through the adult use program. So if they could only get two ounces in a month from their dispensary, um, but they could do one ounce per transaction under the commercial, then again, it, it, it kind of creates a disparity between the medical and, and the commercial. And so the legislation kind of trued them up so it was the same standard. Um, Teresa, um, so um, thank you for that clarification, mm -hmm. Michelle. Um, it, and isn't it also true that um, you, a, a person can only legally have a certain limit? Correct. So, I mean, I, I suppose, yes, you could go from dispensary to dispensary. You could go from a dispensary to a retail outlet to another retail outlet or whatever. And because it's by transaction and there's no like registry kind of thing, but you, you would still be breaking the law because at that point in time, you would have more product than you are legally allowed to have. Correct. You would be in violation of the law and subject to the criminal penalties in Title 18. Yep. Thank you. Um, Dan? Just, you may have touched on this before, but um, are medical prices the same as retail? That's really going to be dictated by the market. The board isn't going to have any pricing, isn't taking to it, onto itself any pricing authority. Okay. So the only the only difference might be tax, but that is true. So that's a good point. Yes, the medical is not subject to tax, but um, but in terms of the prices, the board isn't exercising authority on that. Price. It would be retail if you were whether you're a um, Commercial, you know, someone coming in just off the street buying uh, versus someone who's paying, um, who has a medical. There, there's no, well, you have to just buy at whatever the cost is or whatever they're selling it for. For the most part, yes. However, <laughs> there is a current provision in the DPS rules that requires the current dispensaries to um, provide for low cost or potentially free cannabis pr medical products for folks who can demonstrate need. And the board has essentially imported that into it. And it wasn't actually in rule three, I believe we did that in rule one that integrated uh, current dispensaries who want to become integrated licensees have to have a plan to retain that system under our licensing. And just to follow up, um, a caregiver, can they charge their um, medical patient for the cultivation on, on, on weight or volume or however, or is it just they are a caregiver, so they're they're growing and then they give it to their patient, but that's the charge? Right, so the, the idea of the system is that that isn't really supposed to be a commercial relationship. And of course, if you're selling outside of, at least once we become fully, operational. Once you're selling outside of the cannabis establishment system, then you would be in violation of the rules okay. too. Um, there is, you know, it is lawful under Title 18, I believe, to transfer up to an ounce so that like individuals can do that without getting in trouble. But again, I think if you're actually starting to turn to commercial sales, but we're not a licensed retailer, you would now be in violation of the rules. So I, I don't think that caregivers could do that under our system. Thank you. The final piece I'll just mention is the emergency adoption issue. The um, So Michelle did allude to this, but essentially a lot of stuff has had to happen very quickly in order to get this up and running by the statutory deadlines. The, the plan had been to make sure the adult, the general adult use market would to the best of our ability, and it looks like we're gonna make it, would be up and running at the statutorily imposed deadlines, which means applications are gonna be starting to be accepted this Friday. And the board is ready to do that. 
the um, and the plan had been and to use budget adjustment to push out the transition from the old rules and the old statutes for medical out to the summer, probably July 1st, and give us a little more time to get this piece in place. As the chair mentioned, uh, that did not pass by March 1st. And after further discussion with legislative council and others, uh, the decision was made to, since we already had these rules that already been submitted to LCAR at that point, um, to simply adopt these on an emergency basis. It has been a uh, more abrupt transition for, than the dispensaries expected, but um, because we did try to maintain some continuity in terms of how things operate, we're working through the, um, the pieces of it that the dispensaries have to get used to. I don't think caregivers and patients have noticed any difference that I'm aware of that I've heard about in the office. Maybe just that down. Are there are there questions um, for uh, either legislative council or um, or David Shore general counsel? Yeah, uh, Dane and I don't see it. Okay. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I just wanted to sort of take a big step back to uh, what legislative council was mentioning. Um, the 2004 statute that determined um, what sorts of medical diagnoses apply for uh, medical cannabis, has that been updated at all? It's been, up, you updated it through the years. Um, the definition that is currently in statute that the legislature adopted in 2020 didn't change from the statutory definition of medical qualifying condition that existed prior to the commercial. So it is, and that has not changed in this new system, um, but it has evolved over, over the years. So, you know, one of the more recent changes was you added PTSD as long as uh, the patient is in, engaged with, uh, with psychotherapy or talk therapy, things like that. So it, it has evolved, it, it has evolved. Thank you. My, my, my recollection is that broad brush, much of the medical establishment thinks it's too wide and the patients thinks, think it's way too narrow. Mm -hmm. So as um, the three bears. <laughs> <laughs> and as Michelle mentioned, that is one piece that did not change from the prior scheme. It's the same set of conditions. Carl. Again, this may not be an appropriate forum for this, but I'm just trying to get my head around what, why are we trying to keep these separate but at the same time especially now that you know they could be in the same establishment well, why are we trying to keep them separate i guess uh, i'm not saying i agree or disagree I, I i'm just saying i'm trying to get my head around why are we trying to keep them separate that's a it's a very fair question i think that the I think the reason is that the medical medical patients do get to have certain types of access to both the products and the ways they can access the products that adult use patients are not currently permitted to do. Can you give me an example? So one example is delivery. Adult, uh, regular adult use recreational users are not permitted to, and I should say retail establishments are not permitted to deliver. But dispensaries serving patients are permitted to deliver to patients. And we allow, um, I presume that has not changed for medical. You don't have to be an adult. That's all. Because in true. fact, the whole start of this was right. actually related to um, uh, young children with um, very severe, um, I think it was epilepsy. That's also a good point. And then products are another example where adult use is allowed to be more uh, potent in terms of THC content. So for all those reasons, keeping some separation, even though there's similarities and there's going to be some places where they're close to each other in terms of where sales are happening, some separation is necessary to ensure that we have, um, we're able to regulate that adequately in accordance with the law. Thank you. Okay. I just have, Dan. A, just have a quick question. You said adult use can have higher potency than medical? I meant to say that medical can have medical. higher potency. Yeah, I know. Sorry. I got that too. I got that too. <laughs> Sorry about and, that. Okay. Um, and that, but and the, the difference in between the two systems is 
one is tax free and the other is, you know, is not. Um, That's right. Into, um, I, you have a question? I, I do have just a quick question. Um, uh, David, you were, you were alluding to a little bit, um, a little bit more uh, abrupt change than the dispensaries were anticipating. And um, while, um, you know, I hope that um, folks um, on the consumer end of things haven't felt that, I'm also uh, interested to learn, because we did hear some concerns, you know, um, two years ago uh, from the medical dispensaries. They had at, at that point in time been pretty satisfied with the Department of Public Safety's handling of, you know, oversight and um, technical assistance and things like that. And I'm just wondering the um, how how are we handling the transition process between um, DPS and the Cannabis Control Board? Yeah, it's a very good question. I think one key piece for folks to know is that the, the entirety of the staff that was handling it under DPS has been moved to the Cannabis Control Board, and it is the same three staff members who are there are now operating under the Cannabis Control Board. So that's good. Those, um, you know, relationships, that understanding of who's doing what in the different dispensaries remains that, um, you know, that sort of expertise is, has been important to the board. And so that is, has already been very helpful in helping us manage the transition. And I'd say for the most part, again, the changes, I did list out changes. Um, there's been some sort of like quick, all right, no longer need to track the um, chosen dispensaries, some like quick messages out to dispensaries that have frankly mostly made their jobs easier rather than harder. Uh, but I think for the most part, there's a fair amount of similarity in how um, the things are being conducted. The points where it's going to be harder, a little bit, a sort of new set of work for the dispensary management is that things like renewing their licenses, there will be a, sort of a different set of criteria than what they're used to doing. But again, we're planning to work very closely with them and be very clear. We're not looking to catch anybody out or make anybody's lives un unnecessarily difficult. So we'll be very clear and um, uh, try to be as helpful as we can in making sure that they know exactly what they need to do for renewal processes and things like that. Thank you. This has been fascinating. Mm -hmm. Good. It's, I have to say, from my point of view, it's much more helpful to actually, because my memory clearly in some places was not um, what it um, should have been, should have been in terms of what had been in the past and whatever. But before we let you go, I just want to make sure, go around the table, make sure no one has any um, questions of curiosity or other kinds of questions for um, Michelle or, um, or David. If it's Questions for curiosity. I don't okay. <laughs> well, you know, I mean, because I mean, this is not something. Yeah, you know, we're not passing a bill or anything like that. So, um. I just was curious. One of the things that I heard a lot from constituents, and I went and visited the medical um, plant in Milton, and did a lot of work before we legalized it for everyone. And one of the things that they said. Um, was that they couldn't remain in, they might not be able to remain in business if we had legalized and didn't find a way to roll it in. And I'm curious, are you still hearing that? And are you concerned that we may lose our medical side of the business? Because I do think the public needs to really be assured, especially for children, that they're getting a certain amount of THC. That's right. And the board has been very aware of the concern, which is essentially that there'd be this sort of commercial imperative that would overwhelm the medical dispensaries because they're not allowed to sell to anybody. They're only allowed to sell to patients. So how do you compete with uh, entities that can sell to anybody? And so the, the legislature did one thing that was essential to that, which was allowing the dispensaries to get adult use licenses, what were, what's called integrated licenses in the, in the legislation. And so that should help that should ameliorate some concerns um and i think that other ways the board ha is dealing with that is is trying to be so one one other big thing that the board has done is to make it as they tried to make it as easy as possible for a new dispensary should one want to exist to come online which is not to say they get to skip all of the requirements that we need to make sure that 
people are being safe and operating within the rules, but to really try to streamline that process if anybody would like to do that. And one could imagine a, a, a environment where somebody could say, you know, I'm gonna be a, a delivery specialist for medical patients. I'm gonna purchase product from other people who are making it and my specialty is just driving all over and delivering. So we do think there is some commercial opportunity there that could help patients and could help sustain the, um, the supply of medical cannabis. And the board is aware of that and tried to design some of those regulations to encourage that. Carl. I could just, uh, when we finish this testimony, okay. uh, what are we being asked to do? We're not being asked to okay, do anything. To we are not. Um, um, we're just getting information. We're getting information um, to know, so that we know when the when the when Alcar makes a decision. Yes, Michelle. I just wanted to add is they they would like there's a form. There's a form that I have to fill out. Right, and so I think they they would like to do that. The the rules are before Alcar tomorrow morning. Yeah, so, no, right, but that that is. We just want to know. Right. Do you have a, a concern based on one of those kind of four things that I mentioned? Is there something there that you feel? That, is, is, is not according to um, the, and the, I'm, what I'm you know, I set out in the beginning part of this was to share with the committee what oftentimes goes is, is one of the chair responsibilities and so that's I have to fill out that little form um, and uh, you know if people if you if it is not something that I normally do or that chairs normally do, which is to put it to a committee um, vote, but we can certainly do that if that is something that you would like us to do, Carl. It has to do, the real question is uh, the emergency ruling, correct? In other words, uh, is that what you're asking for this emergency? No, it's actually for the regular rulemaking. The regular rules. Yeah, the emergency rules, assuming we hope everything's okay and Alcar doesn't have any objections. These emergency rules are only really gonna be emergency rules for 16 more days or so. Well, a little longer than that, but 20 more days or so. And um, and so, so part of this was, I wanna say our mutual education on what is the process of rulemaking and what's the role of the chair. And because this is something that um, we haven't, this group hasn't talked about at all. I thought it was important that we um, all sort of hear about it. And um, it was easier than me sitting down with Michelle and David going up, oh, because since my memory on, wasn't it this way before? And like, no, and it wasn't, <laughs> um, you know, because um, I wasn't involved in the legalization um, for adult cannabis use while I was here. This was not, did not come to this we, we, oh, we did. It we did come. Little, oh, it was, it did. I'm sorry. It did come. Happened. It did come. We did vote it out. I, I wasn't part of it. It, 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 was, it did get out with a 6 5 vote, I believe. From, yeah, it was not a unanimous vote. Yeah, no, it <laughs> certainly was not a unanimous vote <laughs> um, on that. Um, I, I, I appreciated, Madam Chair, actually um, having council, both council, uh, yeah. go through the the differences, the changes, what's mm -hmm. happening now, um, you know, because we, this committee has a long, longer right. history than the rest of the body with right. this which, topic. So. Which is sort of why I wanted us, you know, to do that and, and the kinds of, um, but I, to follow up on um, just one, to follow up on, on Jessica's question, sort of around how many, there were, there are eight, how many dispensers? There are five. There are five. Okay. Of the five dispensers, um, how many of them are still um, um, Vermont dispensers? How many of them have have have, have um, are, are somewhere else? <laughs> no, and I mean they're still in Vermont, and they still have Vermont um, owners, but perhaps they have other owners as well. So my understanding is that they are all owned by entities that are not uh, based in Vermont. Okay, and so um, I, I guess, and so I. I guess my unstated assumption is that the worry is, uh, I don't, you know, it's maybe yeah. not there because they're bigger places, you know, that, that there's no dispensary that is just a medical, that, that has an interest solely in medical, if that's 
That's right. And also under even, you know, within Vermont, the dispensaries will all have the opportunity to also sell into the adult use market because the integrated licenses so they can sustain it that way also. Um, I see a question from um, Topper and then the last question will be Dan. Thank Topper. you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Um, I, I guess I, I'm I'm still concerned. I've been sitting here thinking about this, an individual being able to go from one dispensary to another. Um, is the card that the uh, individual used to have, uh, well, I, I, I don't know. Do they still have that card? Do they have to have one? Yes, patient and caregiver cards are still part of the rules. All right, then, then how, how could an individual go from one dispensary to another and be served if they have to present that card? How, what's the check on it so that a person couldn't go from one place to another and get served, get the higher THC? Well, the, the check is that if the person goes above the two ounce possession limit, they will be in violation of criminal law and subject to criminal sanctions. So if an individual has gone off the, the, uh, the truck, so to speak, they've fallen off the truck um, and they're using uh, again, what do they care if, they, if they're going to be criminally responsible. Um, um, Topper, um, if I might um, add, yeah, because you and I, if you remember, we, we sat here, neither one of us were supporters of legalization. That passed. <laughs> and, um, you know, despite it actually passed out of this committee, um, under that law, I could go to I thought, you know, maybe I, I, I could go to five different dispensaries and get, I mean, not, you know, I could purchase. I'm not a medical. I could purchase. I could go to any one of the five and I would still, right? I, yeah. I was going to say, I think what you're talking about is under the commercial adult. Uh, under the commercial the adult. Store, which is not a dispensary. Right, right. Uh, under, the commercial, under the commercial retail, I could go to as many stores as I wanted to. If I ended up purchasing more than um, two ounces, I'm holding more than two ounces or however many ounces it is, I would be, um, you know, at risk of, of breaking the law. And one of the, what Michelle um, clarified for us was that the medical, the rules related to medical could not be any more restrictive than the rules, than the law or whatever the rules for um, um, recre adult recreational. So whether or not, I'm sorry, Topper, whether or not we like this, it is consistent with um, uh, recreational adult use. Yeah, and, and, and yes, Madam Chair, um, I just didn't know. I, I don't know how I missed that. But I just didn't know that that was the case. Yeah, I was surprised when I heard that this morning. Yeah, I didn't realize that was legislative intent to allow that to happen. Oh, I, I, okay, Dan. Hey, actually, I, I don't have a question. Sure. <laughs> so. <laughs> <laughs> I think, I think I know the answer, answer, so it might not be worth asking. What? I, I know. I think I know the answer. So there's no regulation on who can own the integrated licenses. The Good. only entities that are under the statute, the only entities that are allowed to get an integrated license, are the current are the people who had dispensaries on April first of this year, or and, will have dispensaries on April first of this year. And as you said, they're they're not Vermont. They're owned by. They're MSOs, so they're multi-state operators that run these in other states. That's my understanding. I haven't reviewed their paperwork, but that's my understanding. And there's no nothing in our laws or statutes that says you couldn't have one entity buy them all. Well, so you own all of them. No, no, there are limits. If you'd like to, if you'd like to on, my friend, you want to tackle it. 
uh, yeah, you can't uh, do that. So integrated is there can only be a maximum of five integrated mm -hmm. licenses. There will be however many retail stores. So yep. it's not like people who are purchasing only have the option in the adult use to go to an integrated licensee. There will be retail licenses issued to other people in the fall. Under the law that you passed, folks are only allowed to have um, one of each type of license. And so for an integrated, um, it's a one-to-one, -one, right? And so they couldn't have, you couldn't have an existing dispensary purchase all, like have all the integrated licenses, right? Okay. So each That's dispensary right. is entitled to one integrated license, mm -hmm. right? And then under the new system, if you are gonna be a retailer coming into the market, you can have one retail license in one location. So the legislation that you set up was intended to prevent kind of having, you know, uh, MedMen or, you know, someplace like this where you have basically one company that has multiple stores and kind of corners the market. Okay, so you, you can't, you have, you can only have one. Okay, that's yep. right. Thank you. And that's true both for the dispensaries and for the regular adult use. It's a, it's a one license per license type rule. So, so you can't have multiple retail stores. You could have you could be somebody who's both a cultivator and a retailer. So you can integrate vertically, just like the integrated licensees yeah. can, but and you can't. Because, yeah. I thought I read somewhere, and I'll go have to check, but I thought that of the five integrated licenses, they were owned by three MSOs. I, so I have, I have heard that same information, but I am not speaking from a place of expertise when I. Clarify what an MSO is. Pardon me? What's an MSO? Oh, multi state operator. Okay, thank you. And just to clarify, and I don't know who owns what under the right. dispensaries, but under the medical, older medical system, there wasn't anything that said you can only have one type. And okay. so um, and so I think, you know, what had happened over the course of years was you had, you know, one opened up and then they applied later for another license and they had the same owners, but you wouldn't be able to do that under the new system. Okay. Thank you. That's right. Thank you. Thank you very much, David. Thank you all. Appreciate this. And don't hesitate to reach out to me or, or people on the board. We're happy to answer any questions. Um, and just Michelle, um, before you leave, the, um, the, the LCAR points are legislative intent. I, I, I can't find my memo. Sure. <laughs> I'm looking for my memo. No worries. It is... Um, uh, whether it's beyond authority of the agency, whether it's contrary to the intent of the legislature, whether it's arbitrary, or whether or not uh, if they, the agency didn't adhere to the strategy for maximizing public input. And so if you have concerns that, um, that fall into one of those categories with regard to the basis for all cars legal objection. Well, legislative intent is clear on the, um, on the law, in terms of the law that we passed, you talked about, you mentioned, David, the amount of um, public testimony that you took. That doesn't mean everyone agrees with it, but that you um, did that. Um, it's certainly not beyond your authority, since we gave you the authority and told you to do it. Um, and it, it, it does not seem to be arbitrary. It seems to be based on, well, uh, on what the criteria were in the past. So, I mean, um, on that basis, um, I, you know, will be checking off that it meets legislative intent. And I want to say that um, Topper and for others who don't like what some of the rules say, we're getting an awfully long agenda for next year um, uh, <laughs> in terms of that. Um, but thank you, thank you both very much. Um, thank you, committee. Um, and we are um, basically on time in terms of our agenda. Uh, we're gonna take a 15 minute pause or a 15 minute break. And when we come back, we're gonna have a bill introduction um, uh, on